Hey everybody, welcome to this demonstration of installing your ESXi 5.0 host. And I really am very excited about showing this video to you. There's a lot of things to know about installing your host. Now the one thing that we decided to do in this particular video is instead of just showing you just a very basic um, installation of a host is we wanted to show you, well, a very basic installation of a host, but with that basic install going into an environment. You could definitely just go ahead and, and purchase your host and just do a plain old install. And I could demonstrate that and show you how to install ESXi 5.0, no problem. But I think it's important that when you're doing the install, you know what you're installing your, your host into. What's the environment that it's going to live in? And that's going to be very important in planning. Now, we're not thinking of every possible option here, like having extra network cards and those type of things. But we can always build on that as we go along. What we are going to do is we're going to build a host with four NICs, and those NICs are going to be used for different things. Now, these network card configurations can change, and there might be reason to install them by default differently, but for an, just an initial basic demonstration, we feel this is pretty good. Okay, so what we have here in this graphic is we have a router, and you're going to be in some kind of a routed environment. So what we've done is thrown up a Microsoft router with RRAS installed, just doing a basic NAT. And we have three network cards. We have a public card and we have two private cards. So we have a 10-10-10 network, which is black, which is the VMNet2 VM network. And our domain controller is going to plug into that network. Our Windows server that is a member of the domain has the vCenter server and vSphere client already installed. And it's going to plug into that network, the VM2 network, the VM network. And we have our host, which all have VMNIC0, which would be our first network card. And that is going to plug into that network as well. And now, sitting on the host, we're going to get by default vSwitch 0. By default, we're going to get our VM network port group. And then we're going to assign a IP address to our VM kernel port for management. Now, one thing that's very important is this IP address for management for VM kernel. This is kind of our starting connecting point. This IP address, as you see 110 here on host 1, 120 on host 2, and 130 on host 3, is going to be the primary connection point from the vCenter server to manage all the hosts. So vCenter server connects to a process called VPXA, which lives on your host. And the vSphere client can also connect directly to your host through something called host D. But typically, your vSphere client will connect to vCenter, and then vCenter will connect to your host. It should also be noted that your vSphere client can be on a separate box. Another reason we wanted to throw in this router is you may run into a situation where your vCenter server and your vSphere client uh, may actually live on the other side of this router network. That's why after the installation is over, we're going to assign a static IP address to the VM kernel port for management. And when we put that IP address on that VM kernel port for management, we're going to give it its IP address 10.10.10.130 the mask of 24 that we've established, and we're going to point to the gateway of this router. And that's important in the event that we install, you know, we might have like a, a management station somewhere. It could be your administrative desktop or whatever it might be. And you might be sitting on the other side of this router network where your vCenter data center lives. And you want to come across this router to connect in to get to that network. So it's important that we establish a gateway here on the VM kernel port for management so we can get out. Now, technically, the gateway is not 100% required, uh, like in this environment. If we all, if we had everything sitting on this side of the router, our domain controller, we got our vCenter server, vSphere client, um, sitting on this side of this network, specifically our vCenter and vSphere client, there really wouldn't be a reason to put a gateway on the VM kernel port for management. We could actually leave it out, but we really need to leave that IP address on there for a gateway in the event that the vCenter server or the vSphere client ever end up on the other side of this router. The other reason we need a gateway on this VM kernel port for management, if we decide later to set up an HA environment, we need to have a gateway, at least one gateway by default, for what's called a host isolation address, which is really kind of another topic. It doesn't really come into play into install. But for that reason also, you probably want to have a gateway. So basically 99% of the time when you build your host, you want an IP mask and gateway on your VM kernel port for management. Now, what you're going to notice is that we have this thing called VMNet2. All these network cards on the black network, VMNIC0, 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 
and the cards and our router and our domain controller and our host that's going to be running vCenter and vSphere are all plugged into this black network. So this is what's called VMNet2. Now in this demonstration, I'm going to be doing this in a VMware Workstation. Yeah, I know, VMware Workstation, right? That's right. I know it sounds kind of strange, but what we're actually going to do is we're going to install this ESXi 5.0 host into VMware Workstation 8 running on Windows 7, running on a laptop. I know it might seem kind of crazy, but you can, you can do this. And what's even really crazier is that once I've get this environment built, I can be running a ESXi 5.0 host, which is built in VMware Workstation, and I can actually run VMs on top of this in a vSphere environment. Now, this is just for, for demonstration purposes. This is just for a lab environment. You would never do this in production, right? But it's just kind of cool that I can even do it in the first place. So each one of these hosts is going to have a network card that's plugged into a VMNet. So the black network is VMNet2, would be like a VMNet2 is a virtual network or like a VLAN. Imagine when you're plugging into a different physical switch that's plugged into a router. VMNet3 is another uh, VMNet4, another one. And then down on the back end, we have a separate network for our iSCSI network to plug into our storage. And we're going to be using the Microsoft iSCSI target emulator for our storage. So these are all the components that make up a complete vSphere environment. Now what we're going to do is install this third host. We're going to start out with one network card and then we'll add the other cards to it as we go along. Okay, so let's dive in. Let's get the installation going. So we're going to switch over to VMware Workstation. And we just uh, slide this down just a little bit so we can see the whole interface as I go through and demonstrate this. You know, like I said, you know, you can build this environment out, you know, in a lab in your house, which is pretty cool. So we're going to click File. We're going to choose New Virtual Machine. Just keep in mind, my machine has at least 16 gig of RAM. I have a quad core CPU, i7 Turbo Boost, latest, whatever. I also have a solid state drive that I demonstrate this on, which makes it, you know, makes it a really fast demo. It's a Workstation 8. We're going to be installing 5.0 ESXi. Now it says ESX there, but we know that it's ESXi 5.0, right? There is no ESX in 5.0. And then we have already downloaded the VM Visor, the VMware Hypervisor install ISO 64-bit. And I've already got that file sitting right there in that folder, right? So we just point to that. So just go to the VMware website and download the necessary ISO. And then we're going to store this virtual machine. Actually, let me change the name of this before I go too far here. We're going to call this. Uh, this is going to be my third host, ESXi30. And we're going to put this into my C drive. And now I normally wouldn't use my C drive, but in this demonstration, my C drive is my solid state drive. So it just makes for a faster demo. You should probably have a... You know, if you had a real, a little bit beefier server, you could have a separate solid state drive as your E drive or whatever. And we're going to do that there, just like that. And click next. And we need two CPUs. We'll give it two CPUs and one core. Now this right here is a new feature in VMware Workstation 8 and in 5.0 where you can have, I can have one processor with two cores, which gives me two. Or I can have two processors with two core, gives me four. Now, for my demo, I'm just going to leave it at 2. And we'll talk about this feature a little bit more later on when we get into workstation features. Now, the, the memory is going to be 2 gig, and that is a minimum recommendation. We could always make it more if we needed to, uh, based on how much memory you have. Now, for demonstration purposes, you're going to be running a ESXi 5.0 host that's a virtual machine. And then on top of that, you're going to be running other virtual machines, and that's called a nested hypervisor. I know it's crazy, but you can actually run a virtual machine, like just a regular XP or Windows Server 2003, something not too heavy duty for demonstration for learning purposes on top of a virtualized ESXi 5.0 host. Again, only for lab and demonstration purposes, but you can do it, and it works. And it's pretty fast, especially if you follow my recommended hardware. So you could upgrade this memory, whatever you need, but you know, little VMs, little XP VM, you know, 384 mega RAM will work fine on this. Now the networking I'm going to choose later and I'll show you that. We'll let it pick the default controller and we're going to build a virtual disk and it's going to be SCSI and we're going to choose a single disk file and it will be thin provisioned. We don't really use that much disk space. It's 70 meg. This is 
way overkill for our disk space. So we'll just let it grow dynamically if it needs it. And that's the name of our file. That's fine. And we're going to customize the hardware. And we're just going to add a network card. And let me go back to the drawing just for a minute. So what we're going to be doing right now is for the VM, we haven't installed the host yet, just for the virtual machine hardware itself, we're going to add one NIC right now, right? So that NIC is going to be VM NIC 0 during the install. Now in the VMware workstation environment, we take a look at that card, it's going to be custom VM NIC 2. It doesn't say NIC 0 or NIC 1 or anything like that, it's just the first NIC that we install, right? So that's going to establish that he is on the same network as these other guys. Now these other machines, their network cards have already been plugged into VMNet2, 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 VMNet0, VMNet2, VMNet0, VMNet2, right? So that's, that's already been established, right? So this is our new host. So just pretend it's a physical box, right? I got this physical machine. It's got one network card in it. And we're going to boot this up. Let me change this interface a little bit. So we're going to boot this guy up so we can see the whole interface as it comes up. And adjust it a little bit. And we're going to power on this host. And we can see it go through the, the whole uh, installation process. Now there's a little pop-up that Intel BT was disabled. It's a virtual machine. So you know we're not going to have that. And we can see the boot options. One, two, three. Shift, zero to edit boot options comes up. And we're going to go through the loader. We're going to load the ESXi installer. And we can see it go through the basic process of doing the install. It tells me the number of CPUs, how much memory I have, that it's a VMware virtual platform, and the build of the hypervisor that we're working with. Now, the thing about the hypervisor uh, is that it's a very, very small install, right? There's not a whole lot to it. Most of the work is done in vCenter, which is very important. This is a 70 meg, super thin hypervisor that we install on our host. And then all the management's done on the back end the VMs run on the host and there are processes that manage the VMs and track you know what's going on with the VMs which is very important okay now as we get into the install we can see right here that we're working with ESXi 5.0 and it says you know boy before you install this you better go out to www.vmware.com slash resources slash compatibility and make sure that the host that you're installing this on is on the hardware compatibility list well we know that this is because it's our it's our VMware workstation that we know is good. But in the in the real life world, make sure that you've gone out and done that before you ever purchase your hardware. So we can hit escape to cancel or enter to continue. And we're going to accept the end user license agreement. Now just understand that initially you're going to get um, 60 day eval license. The great thing about that is you get the full blown version with every single feature available. So it's a good way to start out and, and learn the product for the first 60 days. So we're going to accept that and we're going to do that install. Now I only have the one hard drive attached to this and there's no connectivity to shared storage. If I had shared storage out there, I could pick remote and I could choose to install my operating system out onto the shared storage and I could do a, a boot from SAN environment. And I'd want to be very careful if I were to go to remote and pick a LUN, a logical unit number, some kind of shared storage that's been presented to this host. And I want to be careful to pick the right one. Now in this demonstration, I don't have anything else, so it makes it very easy to pick the correct one, but you can hit escape to cancel, go to 11 for details. Now if I had multiple remote LUNs, I definitely would want to hit F1 for details and it'll go out there and give me more detailed information about that LUN. So it could be either NFS storage or VMFS storage uh, in either case, either through iSCSI or through Fiber. And it'll show me that that information right there. I can see the model, the vendor, the disk name, and see the MPX path to my storage. Now this is a locally direct attached storage on my host. My LUN ID is zero, my target ID is zero, my capacity is 40 gig, and I can see the path that it's going to be installing um, this into. So that's the path that it sees on this host. Uh, ESXi has not been found. There's no data stores. So I could look at that and specifically I'm looking to see if it, ESXi is already out there or if there are already data stores out there. So that would be important to look at if I had other choices here to pick from. If I'm looking for a LUN and it doesn't show up, I can always hit a 5 to refresh and it'll do a rescan. Maybe a LUN was just presented to me as I was doing the install.
fairly unlikely, but possible. And then we can just do the uh, installation. We're going to choose the US uh, language keyboard. And the root password you established, we'll just call it VMware. We'll call it VMware one bang. VMware one bang. And it performs a scan. Also, another thing I want to mention as it's doing the scan is that what we're doing right now is a manual installation. We're using ESXi 5.0 installable. Uh, you can get the uh, ESXi 5.0 two ways. You can get what's called embedded, or you can just go ahead and get the regular ISO and do the installation yourself. So the installable is what we're doing, and we can install it on a hard drive. We can install it on a USB key on the motherboard. Now it's warning us about the virtualization not being able to in the BIOS. And since we're working with the VM, we don't have that option. But in on a physical machine, we should definitely enable Intel VT. If you go into the BIOS of the VM, there's no option to enable Intel VT. It's something you do on a physical machine, right? So we don't I can go into the BIOS of this machine, but there's no option in there to turn it on. So for what we're working with here, um, it's okay. It just gives you better performance. But we don't really need it in this environment for demonstration purposes, but definitely on a physical machine, always make sure either Intel VT is turned on or AMD V is enabled. Also, if it's um, an Intel processor, make sure you have hyper-threading enabled. At this point, we can go ahead and do the install. We could escape to go back, excuse me, escape to cancel, F9 to go back, or just hit 11 to do the install. Okay, and the installation has completed successfully. So ESXi 5.0 has been successfully installed. And we're going to have the eval for 60 days, which is great. Uh, at that point, we'll have to go out and purchase our proper vSphere license for a host. And, and one thing I always like to emphasize on this is that when you think about names for licensing, they use the term vSphere to refer to the license for the ESXi host. It's, it's more of a marketing thing. So the, the two primary licenses you need to purchase, you're going to have to purchase a license for vCenter. And then you have to purchase your vSphere license per your CPU and memory usage in the 5.0 licensing environment. So... It's very important that you understand what those licenses are. You can also purchase bundled license packages. They've got a bunch of different license configurations you can, you can take a look at. So at this point, we can go ahead and uh, enter to reboot the host. One thing I want you to keep in mind is, you know, during this installation, uh, again, it's, it's in a virtual machine, which is fine, but we're, we're using one network card initially uh, for this installation. You can see some options on the boot, shift zero to enter boot options, to add the boot options, and shift R for recovery. So you can see those options on the boot process. And it'll take a minute for it to bring everything back up and get it loaded. You can see the VM kernel loading all the modules for storage, the VFAT, everything that it needs that the host needs to run. So there's some processes that are running on that host. So it's, it's a very thin hypervisor with these processes that run that we connect to, they're used to give us access to storage to intercept requests when needed. They're used to monitor how many VMs are running, resource utilization, all those things are going on and being managed at the hypervisor level. You saw host D starting. You see VPXA starting. So a couple of main processes. Always remember that vCenter connects to VPXA and if you use a vSphere client without vCenter, it connects to host D. Now, the thing I want to point out here is uh, after the install, you're going to see that uh, we have everything installed, but we don't have any IP address. So if I just switch back here to our drawing real quick, we can see that we've got this host built and installed, but we don't have an IP address for the VM kernel port. So if I want to be able to connect from the vSphere client to the host or through the vSphere client to vCenter, vCenter to the host, I'm not going to be able to do that at this point in time. So I need to come back over and go ahead and get that configured. So the first thing you're going to do is go in and do that uh, customization of your of your host. So we know it's root, we know it's VMware one bang, and we're gonna bring up the direct console user interface. It's that very yellow screen, as you can see. Um, we can configure the password. Uh, we can't configure lockdown mode yet. We'll talk about that later. We're gonna configure the management network. And this is where we take a look at where we have our network adapters. Let me just do that again real quick. You just escape back a level. So we're going to configure the management network. Now notice on this screen that we do not have a host name. Uh, it's just local. Well, actually we have a host name. It's just local host. And that's important. We need to fix that. And we can see that there's no IP address. And if you give it enough time, if there's no DHCP server on your network, you're going to get an automatically 
assigned IP address or an APIPA address to your host. So he doesn't know what APIPA is and can self-assign him that address. So that's not good. So neither one of these are a good thing. Now back to the graphic. Now we're going to have four NICs in here eventually, but during our initial build, we just have one NIC. So let's go take a look at this. And I want to show you on our configuration, first our network adapters. So you can see the name of the adapter, right? The name of the adapter is VMNIC0 and we have a MAC address. That's VMNIC0 and there's going to be a MAC address on that VMNIC0, right? So if we go in and hit enter on network adapters, you can see that we just have one network adapter. I also have the option here to use my space bar to toggle that on and off, right? Now, if you're in a data center and you need to modify these network adapters, you can do it a couple different ways. You can physically go into the data center and go to your KVM or physically to the server and go get right to the direct console user interface. If you ever need to get in here and modify these adapters to turn them on or off, like if there's a misconfiguration problem, you can also use the vendor's card, direct access card, whatever it is. Like for example, if it's Dell, it would be a DRAC card. If it's HP, it would be an ILO card. If it's IBM, it's an RSA card, whatever Cisco uses. And then you could console directly in to that base management controller and then have access to that host remotely to get to this screen. So this is a very important configuration screen. It's very, very BIOS-like. They call it the BIOS-like direct console user interface. So we can see that we have one adapter and we have no VLANs. If I wanted to assign a VLAN tag, I could do that right here. And I'm not going to assign a VLAN at this point. Actually, I'm not gonna do it VLAN in this install. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go back down here and configure the IP address first. So if we look at my diagram, because I've got this all planned out, right? Because I did my planning ahead of time. My IP address is going to be 10101030 with a mask of 24, and our gateway is going to be 101010. So we're just going to toggle down in here. We're going to set that to static. And we're just going to do a 10.10.10.130. And we're going to do a 255.255.255.0. Of course, these IP address and masks can be whatever you want for your network. It doesn't have to be 10. It could be any private address you want to use. My gateway is 10.10.10.1. Now, again, I'm going to emphasize that this gateway is 100% optional. But you should also consider the fact that if your vCenter or your vSphere client ever goes on the other side of the router where your data center lives, where your hosts are, if you don't have a gateway, they're not going to be able to connect into those hosts. Also, in the future, uh, if you decide to enable HA, you need a gateway for what's called a host isolation address. It's very important. It should also be noted that you can have other VM kernel port IP addresses for different things, but you're always only going to have one IP address for a gateway. All right. So the one thing I want to point out here is the ESXi host can only have one gateway. He only has one IP stack. It's not like a it's not like a Windows machine where every time you add an IP, you get a new IP stack. This host has one IP stack, so he only has one gateway. He can have multiple IP addresses for different VM kernel ports, but he's only ever going to have one gateway. And we're going to go down here and modify the DNS configuration. And under DNS, we're going to specify who the primary DNS server is. This is going to be 10.10.10. And we'll look at our network diagram to see who our DNS server is. And our DNS server is going to be 10.10.10.100. That's this guy right here. That's our domain controller and our DNS server. We don't have an alternate. And we're going to change the host name to ESXi03. And our custom DNS suffixes, just in case uh, he needs it, it's itvc.local. That's our domain that we live in. If we had multiple domains, we can specify those there. We can also specify that in the GUI uh, once we add the host into vCenter. Okay, now I just want to switch over to my domain controller. And I want to show you our environment here for our domain controller. So we're going to go to our domain controller, and we're going to open up our... Uh, DNS. Now, one thing that's very important is when you add your host, as we did, we've given him the proper pointer to our DNS server, and we've given him the proper host name. 
But one thing that it doesn't do for us is it does not add the records to DNS for us. So we have to go back over here and create a brand new A record in the zone. Now my domain name is itvideocoach.local or itvc.local. I have a DNS zone called itvc.local and I need to make sure that I manually add the host record and put in the right IP address. This IP is 130 and I add that in there. Now I don't have a reverse lookup zone or I would add that. Probably wouldn't hurt to have a reverse lookup zone, but we're good right there. And that's going to give us communication for fully qualified name resolution, which we really need for a lot of processes that go on in the background for us. Okay. So we can see that there. So that looks pretty good. And that's our configuration for that. We're going to escape out and we're going to say yes to apply those changes and we're restarting the management network and it is restarted. Now we can also manually restart the management network. Now one thing you got to be careful with is if you're doing any maintenance and you have any VMs plugged into this switch on this management network here and you restart that management network, those VMs potentially could be unavailable for a short period of time. So an alternative, which you may want to do, is to go to troubleshooting options and you can actually just restart the management agents. So restarting the management agents just controls access to management and doesn't restart the whole network. So that might be a good option for you, something to be aware of. And now what we're going to do right now is test things to make sure we have everything configured correctly. So what we're going to do is we're going to ping the IP address of 1, which is the gateway, 100, which is our DNS. Now this is a little funky. Now we want to resolve the host name. can never resolve a host name with the dot on it. But what we can do, now the reason they give you the dot is so you can just easily type in the domain name afterwards. If you try to resolve the name like this by default, you're going to get an error because it can't find ESXi-03 dot and there's nothing after the name. So you could resolve it this way, that would work, but that'll take a while because it's looking for the NetBIOS name. But if you add in the DNS information and do your test, it goes quite smoothly. We can get to the gateway he's turned on and we can get to the DNS and of course it failed for me. Let me just um, make sure I've got my configuration right here. So I'm going to go back over to my configuration for my IP and make sure I didn't misconfigure anything. That looks right. And we're going to go take a look at DNS and make sure I pointed him to the right server. So he's supposed to point to my DNS, which is 10, 10, 10, 100. That's right. 10, 10, 10, 100. And the host name is three. And now what I'm going to do here, just to make sure I don't have any problems, is I'm going to go to my DNS server and I'm going to clear my caches. Now, if you ever add any names and DNS, clearing the cache can be your friend. We'll also do the, right, and we'll switch back over to our host and we'll test that management network one more time. And we'll see if I have any luck here. And no luck there. So let's go back over to our host one more time, our domain controller. And let's make sure we added the record into DNS correctly. And we did not. So there's a good example of making a typo. So we're going to delete that. You know, sometimes when you're building things out, it's better to make mistakes. You can actually learn from them a little bit better. So we'll do this, zero, 03. It was actually maybe a good thing in some strange way. And this is going to be 130 because that is the IP address of this actual host. All right, so that looks good. And we'll go back over here and we'll test that management network again. And we'll see if we have success this time. Ah, oh, look at that. It's a beautiful thing.
Now, I just wanted to show you one thing, though. When this first comes up, if you were just to hit enter like this and do the test, it's going to fail because of that dot, not because anything's wrong in DNS. If you do it like this without the dot, it just always defaults to the dot there. Now, if I do it like this without the dot, it will resolve it, but it takes a while. It's doing a NetBIOS-based resolution for this guy in the flat network to try to find him. And he's looking, and he's looking, and eventually it will find him. There it goes. So here's just a point of how important DNS is in your configuration. So by adding DNS for name resolution, and we do the test, you're going to see how much faster it is. So it's very important that whenever, see that, see how quick that was? It's very important that when you install your host, that you make sure that you go to DNS and, and statically add these records. Now, in the Microsoft world, we do have the option to make sure that we have dynamic update turned on, right? Which we do, right? Even if it was set to non-secure and secure. Now, we have dynamic update turned on, but the ESXi host doesn't know anything about dynamic update. Doesn't know anything about it at all. So you still have to manually go in there and actually add those records manually. Okay, so that's very important. All right, so some other things we can do here is um, we can restore the network settings to the default, configure the keyboard, which we've already picked our language during the installation, uh, troubleshooting options. Now here we can enable the ESXi shell, which is disabled by default. We can also enable SSH, which is disabled by default. And if some, somebody was connected for too long, we could actually go in there and modify what that timeout would be. So if somebody sits idle for more than 300 seconds, we're going to time them out. And of course, we can restart the management agents that I showed you before. Right? We can also view some system logs. And the system logs we can view here are our syslog, our VM kernel log, our configuration log to see how we built the host, the management agent, which is host D. And that's what the vSphere client connects to directly if we're not going through vCenter. The VPXA, which is what vCenter connects through. And then we have the uh, VMware ESXi observation log to monitor overall processes. So we can view all those logs directly on our host. We can also see if we're licensed, what our serial numbers and our keys are. And we can reset the system configuration. So there's a lot of options there within your ESXi Direct Console user interface. And now we can see that we have the uh, host available here with this name. We have the proper IP address and it's static. And there's also a little website on this host that we can download some tools from uh, directly from the host. And I'll show you that in another video. So we have our host ready to go. Now the one thing I wanted to show you here in vCenter to kind of give you a visual of what this looks like from the other hosts that have been added into vCenter. So we're going to take a look at this from the vCenter perspective. So ESX 1 and 2 have already been added. Now I've built my host and he's kind of sitting out here by himself. I'm going to show you in another video how to add the host. But with the host added, if we go to configuration of the host and we actually take a look at the uh, networking, you can see that this is what you would get by default. You would get your vSwitch 0, you get the virtual machine port group VM network, and you get the VM kernel port for management. And you can actually go to properties and take a look at this vSwitch 0. And you can see the network adapters that we have plugged in, just the one. We can see vSwitch 0. And we can see the settings for vSwitch 0. We can also see the VM network. This is our port group. And we can see that there's no VLANs assigned. And we can see all the settings being inherited from the vSwitch. We can also see the VM kernel port. And I really wanted to show you this before we move on. Because you can see here that we have management enabled. Nothing else is enabled on this port. right? So you can actually see that configuration there. Now, if I were to add another VM kernel port, and I pick a VM kernel port, say, for vMotion, and I go through this wizard, you're going to see that there's one gateway. So I have an option to add these other three VM kernel ports. You can add a VM kernel port for vMotion. You could add a VM kernel port for FT. You can add a VM kernel port for management, right? which we already have. It doesn't matter how many VM kernel ports that you have, you're only going to have one gateway. Now you can edit here, but you're changing it for everybody. You're changing it for everybody. So let me go back to this graphic. So this host can only have one gateway. 
one IP stack, multiple VM kernel ports. Now you only get one VM kernel port by default, which is for management, which is for the vSphere client to connect to host D or vCenter to connect to VPXA, right? And then the last thing we can do is we can go back to your host and we're going to go down into the host and we're going to shut the host down. And we're gonna go ahead and shut that host down. And then once the host is shut down, we're gonna add in the network cards we're gonna need for future demonstrations. So this will give you an idea of how to add the network cards. Now, on a physical machine, these network cards might already be physically in the box, right? So that would be something you'd have to consider. Maybe only cable up the one card so you can see which one's live. That might help you. Maybe tag them or label them on the physical machine. So we're going to edit this virtual machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to add three more network cards. So we're going to add a network card that's going to set on VMNet 3. And that will be for production. That will be VMNet 1. We're going to add an adapter that's going to set on VMNet 4. And VMNet 4 will be our vMotion network, VMNet 2. Now you're going to see VMNIC2 here, and we're going to add another adapter that's going to be VMNet5, and VMNet5 is going to be for our iSCSI network. And then click OK, and then when we power that machine back up again, we're going to see that we have multiple adapters in our host, and we'll let that boot up. Okay, so our host is booted back up. We're going to go back in and we're going to take a look at our configuration now with the extra NICs added. And we're almost done with this video. So this will kind of wrap things up for us. So we're going to go back into uh, Configure Management Network. Now nothing's changed, but if we take a look at our network adapters, we now have four NICs. So when you go to the Direct Console User Interface and you go to Configure Management Network, you select Network Adapters. You can see all the physical NICs in your host. Now, what we have by default under this is this is for our management network. We're configuring the management network. So basically on this screen, what they're asking you is how many cards do you want on your management network? Now, if I accidentally did this and I had VMNIC 0 and VMNIC 1 both on the management network, I actually would not be able to connect to my host over the management network because VMNIC 0 is on one subnet and VMNIC2 is plugged into a different network. So it's very easy to run into this misconfiguration by accident. So the way you would do that is either DRAC in or ILO in or RSA in, go to directly to the console and just use your spacebar when you get into this interface under the management network and toggle off the cards that are not on that same subnet. So you can actually run into a problem if that is the case, right? So they have to be configured to be um, on separate subnets or you can also configure something called explicit failover, but we'll get into that later. But typically, uh, two cards on two different networks uh, for management is going to cause you not to be able to connect, and that's how you can solve that problem. And I've seen that happen several times in real life, so that's a good one to be aware of. And once you have that set up, now you have your host ready, and you can decide how to use these other adapters. Now, we're going to use uh, the one we added for VMNIC 1 for production on VMNet 3. We're going to use VMNet 2 for VMNet 4 for a vMotion network. And we're going to use VMNet 3, our fourth network card, for vSwitch 1 for IP storage to connect out to IP storage. Okay? And that's how that whole thing works. Um, just keep in mind, you could have multiple adapters on management. You could have multiple adapters for production, multiple adapters for vMotion, and multiple adapters for IP storage, at least two, typically. Uh, you could also take these three and put them on one network and then separate the storage on the other. Also, VMware does not require you to separate anything out at all. If you wanted to, the storage, your vMotion, your production, your VM network, your management network could all be on one network. I would think at the very, very least, you'd want to separate at least the IP storage network from everything else. And the division I have here is completely optional and not absolutely required, but is recommended. Okay, so you've got your host installed, you're ready to go to the next step, and the next step is to take that host and add him into vCenter.
So make sure you watch the follow-up video for this one, which would be how to add your host into vCenter. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot.